Good evening. Um, for those in the audience, uh, good morning, good afternoon for those who may be watching us from somewhere else in the world or I'm sure re-watching us at a later point. My name is Martin Spoprinskis, I'm here at UCL Laws and my role tonight is as the chair of tonight's event, who, what, when, where and how of damages or calculation, a joint event by UCL Laws and HKA reflecting on key challenges in damages valuation. So that is plainly a hugely, hugely important topic, even if it is sometimes not fully appreciated as such by their academics or practitioners. And my usual line that I use to introduce it that um, Colin has heard before, so perhaps he'll not be laughing as loud as those in the audience, is from a speech that was given a number of years ago by the much uh, lamented and missed Judge James Crawford, who was delivering his Hudson Medal Lecture at the American Society of International Law. And uh, he uh, told the, retold the conversation with a student of his in Cambridge, where the student had told him, I, Judge Crawford, that he was very much interested in investment law as far as substantive issues went, but really was not that much interested in remedies. And Judge Crawford responded that, well, that in his experience, he had found that clients usually did not share that perspective. And so I think that, that sort of brings out uh, the uh, sense about the importance, uh, but also the extent to which sometimes these topics are overlooked. And so it brings me particular, particular pleasure to uh, bring UCL and HKA together for the second time, uh, building on last year's very successful event. So I'll be very brief. I will introduce uh, the speakers for tonight. Uh, then I will give them the floor. And afterwards, I will moderate the discussion, both from questions coming from here, as well as those submitted through the Mentimeter and the online audience. So we have with us tonight Colin Johnson, who is a partner in HK's Forensic Accounting and Commercial Damages Practice. Joseph Kirby, who is an Associate Director in HK's Forensic Accounting and Commercial Damages Practice. And Jennifer Carnegie, who is a Qualified Chartered Accountant in the same practice. I have given but a very abbreviated version of their extremely, extremely impressive CVs that you have fully on the account on the event webpage at UCL, but I think it will be, I'm sure you'll agree that you'll be much more interested in hearing what they have to say. Well, Colin, team, over to you. Thank you all for coming, those in person, and thank you for those who are uh, watching online. Uh, it brings me great pleasure to speak to you here at UCL, um, not least because I, because I spent four years of my life studying here uh, many moons ago, so it's it's really great to be back on the other side of the lectern today. So today, as Martin's introduced, we're going to be talking about commercial damages. Now, commercial disputes tend to be complex matters, and when we get into the assessment of damages, there's the risk or the tendency to get somewhat stuck in the weeds in terms of you know, detailed issues. The purpose of this talk is really to take a step back and just look at what are some of the very fundamental questions that need to be addressed uh, in any sort of assessment of damages that we typically encounter. So, first of all tonight, I'm going to be speaking about whose loss are we calculating. So, how do we properly define the claimant and assess who has been actually damaged by the, the actions in dispute? And, you know, to what extent has the claimant itself suffered from the alleged damages? And to what extent has those damages been passed through or mitigated? Uh, then my colleague Jenny is going to be discussing what does the loss encompass, so uh, what's the basis for the loss, what's the conceptual framework for thinking about damages awards in general. Uh, and then she's going to touch on issues around the valuation date and the date over which uh, losses are assessed. And as she's going to explain, uh, that can have a significant impact on the final damages award. And then I'm going to discuss issues around where the dispute relates to. So where is the asset in question located? And you know, what uh, geographic specific risks 
is it affected by and to what extent are those factored into a damages assessment? Uh, and finally, I'm going to touch on as briefly as I can uh, in a meaningful way the kind of key methods by which we tend to assess losses as valuation and damages experts. Uh, and these are sort of the, the key methodologies that you'll encounter time and time again <coughs> in any uh, damages uh, assessment. Uh, finally, then we're going to wrap up with some takeaways and perhaps look at some further case studies. So, who? Uh, in a sort of textbook world, we, we have a simple dispute between two parties where there's a clear contract. Uh, the parties are self-contained. The damage is clearly identifiable. Um, and there's no sort of collateral damage or, or further you know, outside parties involved in, in the claim. Now, in reality, commercial disputes tend to be much messier than that. There tend to be any sort of commercial arrangement tends to have multiple concept, uh, contractual agreements between multiple parties. There are potentially multiple potential breaches uh, across multiple dates. So we really need to, at the outset and throughout the, the engagement, we really need to understand the fact pattern of the dispute. And that's really key to sort of framing how we go about uh, assessing the loss going forward. So what are some of the key aspects to consider in that respect? Firstly, has any loss been passed through to others by the claimant? Now, perhaps this one is easiest to illustrate by way of a sort of simple example. So imagine we have a dispute between uh, a producer of an end good, let's, say, let's call it the producer, and uh, a supplier that supplies a key input to that producer. Let's call it the, the supplier. Now, it's been found that the supplier has engaged in a price-fixing cartel whereby it has overcharged the producer for a key input uh, which it needs to produce its good. Now, on the face of it, we might think that the producer has been damaged to the extent that it's been overcharged by the supplier. But if we look a bit deeper, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, you know, if, for example, the producer has been able to pass on some of that increased cost through to its customers, through its increased pricing, then it has not fully suffered the effect of that uh, uh, excess price. And the extent to which the producer has been able to do so is a, a complex question. Uh, because in any normal market, a, uh, a seller can increase its prices, but the consequence of that will be reduced demand. Now, the extent to which demand has been reduced is you know, a complex economic issue that uh, requires analysis of the shape of the demand curve, price elasticity of demand, and so on. That's a technical issue in and of itself. Um, and then we can imagine there's additional complexity. Perhaps the producer is selling to multiple markets across multiple geographies, each of which have separate um, shape to their demand curve. Or perhaps the, the producer is not the uh, seller to the end customer, but perhaps it's just one entity in a longer supply chain. So again, you have to look at how the effects can be passed on through that supply chain. So you can see that this gets very complex very quickly. And I guess the point for you as lawyers is not necessarily to follow through all the economic analysis that this implies, but to understand the underlying facts so that you can frame the, the problem and you know, frame the, the damages um, issues uh, clearly at the outset of any uh, dispute process. And then we can look, about, look at how the claimant has been able to mitigate its losses. So uh, clearly there is an obligation for the claimant to mitigate its losses where it can. And to the extent that it's been able to do so, uh, in terms of damages, the, the defendant or the respondent is effectively the beneficiary of that mitigation. Um, and then we, we need to look at which parties should be bringing the claim. So going back to my previous slide where I talked about potentially multiple contractual agreements between multiple parties. You know, there could be owners, contractors, subcontractors, insurers, lenders, guarantors. We need to understand 
you know, throughout the dispute process how each of these parties has potentially been impacted by uh, the alleged breaches. So I'm going to pass on to Jenny now to talk about the what. So the most obvious question in answering the what of damages <coughs> is what is the loss that the claimant suffered? There are many different types of loss that the claimant may have suffered. We've listed seven different types of losses here. So has the claimant suffered a loss of value? That is, has their investment or their company, their business, lost a value as a result of, say, an appropriate asset or investment? Has the claimant suffered a loss of profits? For example, has a contractor made a delay in, in completing the project, and as a result, the claimant has had to spend initial, additional costs and therefore their profits are reduced? Or what about a loss of opportunity? Has the claimant missed out on being able to invest elsewhere? because they haven't been able to get the funds from the project due to the actions of the respondent. Or loss of reputation. Perhaps the claimant has suffered a loss of reputation through, for example, an, an unauthorised use of its brand name, so it's had a loss of sales. Or what about a sunk cost? That is, the cost that the claimant has invested into a project, which they won't be able to recover through the actions of the respondent. Or return on investment. Is it possible that the claimant's return is lower than it should have been? the actions of the respondent, or liquidated damages, which are pre-agreed um, damages, typically in construction contracts, so around, around uh, for example, delays that a contractor um, may incur and if they're responsible for. What's important to note is that, the con that, that a claimant can suffer multiple types of losses at the same time, but it's vital that you don't double count losses. So for example, the claimant cannot claim for the sunk cost of the initial investment and the lost profits from that investment because in the but-for world, they would only ever receive those profits, not also the investment that they initially put in. So now is a good time to introduce a concept called the but for -less actual framework. This is a concept that we use, I mean, this is a concept that we use quite a lot in calculating um, loss of profits and loss of value. So this graph shows you the but-for profits and the actual profits. And the difference between the two is the compensation that's required to put the claimant back in the position, the but-for position, that they would have been in had the, had the claimant, had the respondent not caused damage or breached the contract. Part one of the graph shows the historical losses, that is the losses that have already occurred, and part two of the graph, the future <coughs> losses that may be incurred in the, future, in the future as a result of the respondent's actions. This is a framework that we'll come back to later because it's, it's quite vital in the, in the work that we do. So one of the types of losses that we consider was a loss of value. But what does value mean? Well, value can have many different definitions depending on who you're talking to and the context of, of the case. So we've listed six, um, six different types of value here, but there are, a lot, there are many others. The first is market value or fair market value. This is the value that would be agreed between a willing buyer and a willing seller who have acted without compulsion and have acted knowledgeably in terms of the facts and circumstances of the agreement. Then there's value in use. This is the value to a potential owner or the owner of a business holding an asset and using the asset to generate cash flows rather than selling the asset. Then there's replacement value. This is the amount of the cost to replace the value on a, for a like-for-like -like basis. Then there's fire sale value. This is the value of home that's controlled by a company stress. So in a for sale or needing or in a sale which is done more quickly than would be expected. Then there's synergistic value, which is the value gained from the combination of two businesses. So for example, there could be value gain from cost efficiencies or a value gain from being able to access a new market. You can imagine this type of value is very subjective depending on who you're talking about. One company may gain increase revenues from accessing a new market, whereas another company may gain cost efficiencies by, by, by being able to synergize departments. Then there's book value. This is the type of value which is often used by accountants. It represents the cost of the assets, less of liabilities, the company's balance sheet. You might think that this, this type of value should be the same as maybe market value, but actually accounting standards define value differently, so it isn't always the case. The most important thing is to be aware of which type of value is applicable. And they can have, and they can have many different, they can result in many different um, valuations depending on which value you're talking about. <coughs>
So let's have a case study. Let's look at a case study that ties this together. In this case, the respondent was tendering for construction contracts via an alleged unauthorised JV agreement. In this unauthorised JV agreement, the agreement shareholding was significantly lower than in the authorised JV agreement. Ultimately, the JV was awarded the contracts. So what is the type of loss that suffered here? It seems an obvious loss of profits. The claimant is entitled to a lower share of profits than they would have been had, had the contracts been awarded by the authorised JV agreement. But what about future profits? Is it, has the claimant just suffered from the awarded contracts or are there future contracts that the claimant will miss out on with the JV being abandoned because say the claimant and respondent can no longer work together? Alternatively, what about thinking about the loss as a result of wasted investment, the sunk cost? Remember, you can't claim both the initial investment and the loss of profits. And was there a loss of reputation? If the claimant is essentially pushed out of the JV, the shareholding, but the JV is still being run in their name, perhaps there's been reputational damage if the JV is run poorly? So this case study shows that even in a simple case, there's many different types of loss that can be considered. So moving on to the word of damages. So here there are really two key questions to consider. The first one is, when is the loss period? That is, what is the period of time that the claimant has suffered damage or is expected to suffer damage? Or, referring back to our but for less actual framework, the time required for the actual to catch up with the but for. In theory, the loss period should be the time needed to put the claimant back in the position they would have been in had the breach or damage not occurred. The type of loss being claimed will impact the loss period. In a loss of value case, where a business has been completely destroyed and will never return to its original value, the loss could be indefinite if it's, if it's argued that that business will never return to prior profitability. In a loss of profits case, typically, the damages will be over a finite period of time. For example, if a government expropriates an oil and gas asset, that oil and gas asset does not have an infinite life. It has a finite life because, because the resources don't last forever. So that loss period will be finite. There are other aspects to consider when determining the length of the loss period. The first is the term of any contracts that cash flows are being forecast from. Is that term reasonable? Is it in line with market expectations? It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be appropriate to assume a 10-year contract if the market only awards two-year contracts at a time. The useful life of an object of the asset that cash flows are being forecast from. Again, back to the oil and gas asset example, it wouldn't be appropriate to forecast, say, 300 years of, of cash flows from the oil and gas asset if it's only expected to be useful for 20 years. And the availability of the market. If you're forecasting an indefinite loss period, is it reasonable to assume a market will be around indefinitely for that product? Maybe for an essential product, but probably not for a non-essential product. So, Returning back to the but for less actual framework, a finite loss can be shown on a graph like this, where the actual position catches up with the but for position. This could be, for example, a delay. Ultimately, the cash flows end up being what they would have been, but they're just later. Then there's an ongoing loss period. Here, the actual position never catches up with the but for position. This graph could suggest indefinite losses. As you can imagine, Forecasting cash flows on an ongoing basis is much more complicated and will involve a lot more, a lot more assumptions and uncertainty. The next question to consider when talking about when is the date, when is the when of damages, is when is the date of, of damages present? On the past two graphs, you may have been wondering what the assessment date represents. This is the date at which the damage or the calculation of loss should be performed. The important thing about this date is it determines what information can be factored in to the assessment of loss. That is, only information that is known or, no, or knowable at that point in time can be included in the valuation. Now, considering cases can go on for many, many years, that can significantly impact the information that can be factored in. Typically, there's two options in, calculate, in determining the date of loss. Date of breach or date of award. You might hear a date of breach a date of breach in the context of evaluation as an ex-ante valuation or a date of award as an ex-post valuation. A date of award valuation or loss assessment is calculated today. That means full hindsight of all the information 
all the facts and circumstances that came to be following the breach can be factored in. Whereas date of breach valuation, that's not possible. Only what was known or knowable at the date of breach can be factored in. This can have a significant impact. For example, new cost versus Russia, there was a difference of three times between the two valuations. The date of award valuation was $66 billion. The date of breach valuation was $22 billion, just because of different information. And ultimately, the higher date of award valuation was considered appropriate. The date of breach is typically used in commercial arbitrations, whereas date of award can be seen in investment treaty disputes. But it can be argued that date of award allows a more full compensation, being able to consider all the facts and circumstances. There have been cases where, despite the date of breach being appropriate, hindsight information is used as a sort of reasonable check on the final value that is determined. Given that both approaches have been accepted, as well as a hybrid approach, it's important to consider the facts and circumstances of the case and discuss it with your expert early on. There are a couple of other interesting matters when considering what the date of damage assessment should be. The first is the existence of multiple breaches. If there's multiple breaches, there's multiple dates of breach, which can mean having to isolate different losses and, and look at them individually. Then there's the existence of lawful and unlawful expropriations in investment treaty disputes. Sometimes it's argued that the existence of an unlawful expropriation should give rise to a date of award valuation. <coughs> it's possible for there to be a link between the length of the loss period and when the date of damage assessment should be carried out. Remember that the date of loss or the assessment, the assessment date or the date of damage assessment essentially determines what information can be factored in to your loss assessment. So if the information available, for example, on the useful life of an asset at the date of breach is different to the date of award, your length of loss may be different. So we'll now look at a case study to tie this together. This case involved a mine asset that was allegedly expropriated by government in the early 2000s, but for which arbitration proceedings were ongoing 15 years later. Ultimately, a claim at the date of award was put forward because they alleged that the mine was un unlawfully expropriated. So what were the key matters to, to consider in, in this case study? Well, considering the information available at the date of breach and the date of award here, there are two main impacts. First, on the price of the minerals that were going to be extracted from the mine. In the early 2000s, there was a boom in commodity prices. A valuation performed at a date of breach would not factor in those higher prices, whereas a valuation performed at a date of award had full hindsight over all, those price, all the higher prices it came to be. And secondly, the information on the quantity and quality of the minerals that were to be extracted. Once mining was done, it could be better quality information, more reliable information about the actual volume of minerals and the quality of the minerals that were going to be extracted. To highlight the impact of, of, of the change in mineral prices, this graph shows you the commodity price index over the last 20 odd years. You can see in the early 2000s, 2004, the commodity prices doubled by 2008. In the date of award valuation, this full hindsight information could be included. At date of breach, all we had to go on was prices in the early 2000s, which are considerably lower. So hopefully you can see that date of award that the data valuation has significant impact on the total damage claim. So I'll now hand back to Joe for the where. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about um, country-specific and region-specific factors that tend to uh, have an impact on the assessment of damages, both from a sort of technical valuation perspective and from a uh, more fundamental sort of factual perspective. So. The country in which the asset is located, and I'll touch on what I mean by located in a minute, can have significant impacts uh, on the claim. So, and this is often an issue that arises in uh, investor state disputes where an asset has been expropriated in a region that uh, is perhaps perceived as a risky uh, location for investors, and investors require uh, an additional return to compensate them for the risk of investing in that region. So that, that can give rise to what we call a country risk premium in, in our valuation analysis. Uh, 
So what is the additional return an investor would require to compensate them for the additional risk associated with the asset being located where it is located? And in addition, there, there might be currency or, or currency elements that we need to take into consideration. So, for, an, for example, an asset located in, in uh, Syria, for example, where there was high, there's been quite high inflation recently, to what extent should that be factored into your calculation? If you're looking at discounted cash flows, which I'm going to touch on shortly, to what extent is that inflation both reflected in your cash flow forecasts and to what extent is it reflected in the rate at which you discount those cash flows? Um, <clears throat> and to what extent does the business actually do business in the local currency? Or to, or to what extent is, are its revenues derived in dollars, for example, a commodities business? Now, the, these are the sort of questions we need to be uh, looking at. So, so I'm going to talk a bit more about country risk. So when we're evaluating qualitatively the exposure of the asset to country risk. There's a few different um, sort of levels of analysis we need to do. First of all, we need to understand, in general terms, what are the country-specific risks of the country in which the asset is located. <coughs> um, so that, that could be economic risks. So to the extent that the, the country has economic issues which would affect uh, aggregate demand or demand within the industry for the product uh, might lead to uh, changes in fiscal policy, changes in taxation, political risks. Uh, is there a certain element of corruption involved in doing business in the country? Is there a risk of expropriation? Uh, natural disaster risks, risks of war, all of these things we need to take into consideration. <coughs> And there are a number of sources that um, seek to estimate these things. So you'll see in the picture here, I've, I've put a breakdown provided by PwC, for example, where they categorize each country uh, in various risk buckets based on a range of criteria. And you can look to a number of these kinds of sources, there's lots lots of these are published, um, to get a general sense of what the, the overall riskiness of the country is. And then once you have that, you need to understand how is the asset in question exposed to those country-specific risks. So, you know, it's, is it headquartered there? And if it is, does it, does it generate its revenues there? You, know, you could have a, a business located in one country that sells in a multitude of other countries. So to what extent is it exposed the, to the riskiness of each of those different countries? It could have its production facilities in another country. Again, we need to understand this, this full picture uh, before sort of quantifying the effects of all of these risks. And once we've got that understanding, then we go to the third level, which is reflecting that in the valuation, so quantifying the country risk exposure. Um, and that can be done in a few different ways. I mean, I'm not going to touch on this in detail, but in valuation practice, we typically uh, consider country risk premiums this is an additional risk premium uh, included in our discount rate when we're looking at a discounted cash flow analysis. We can also compare the multiples at which uh, comparable companies are traded across different countries. If, the, if uh, companies in one country tend to be traded at a lower multiple than comparable companies in another country, is that difference the result of the additional risks associated with that particular country? So getting a, a general picture of the, the extent to which the asset in question is exposed to country-specific risks then allows you to build up uh, more concrete analysis as to how that should be reflected in the valuation. And again, the point for you as lawyers is you might not be experts in assessing the, the quantitative analysis that we as experts do, but you can certainly assess the, the overall sort of story that we're telling that leads to that sort of numerical piece of analysis. Um, so, th so those were uh, those were kind of the, the valuation points. Then there's sort of other location impacts that you know, generally inform how we understand perhaps more of the background to the dispute and and how we think about the dispute more generally. So local market availability. Are we looking at a business that's you know? developing a product or, or an asset 
for which a local market has not yet been established. To what extent do we need to factor that into our considerations? Um, does the transport and logistical infrastructure exist in the country? If not, what does that imply for the valuation of the asset? And to what extent is there financial infrastructure? So if the owner of the asset requires uh, finance in order to make further investment that's required in order to realise the value of uh, the, the current asset, if there are constraints on the access to that finance, again, we need to think about whether that therefore impacts how we think about the but-for scenario and how we think about the overall value of the assets. And finally, you know, if we're looking at perhaps natural resource business businesses, there might be uh, issues around geology. This is where we might think about getting technical expertise in, um, you know, to assess to what extent are, are the resources in the ground, you know, to what extent do they have the value that, that is being claimed. So now I'm going to go on to the how. So this is kind of the most technical sort of pure valuation topic. I'm going to try and keep this sort of high level and if you have any more technical questions at the end, I'm happy to go into those. But broadly, when we get into quantifying damages as experts, there's three primary methods or approaches that you're going to see time and time again. So the first of which is the income-based approach. So this determines the value of the asset by explicitly calculating a set of cash flow or profit forecasts and then discounting those at a rate that reflects the level of risk and the time value of money. And I'm going to go on to that uh, a bit more in the next slide. Uh, the next approach, market-based approach, so this is where we're looking at um, comparable transactions as a valuation benchmark. So comparable con transactions can mean transactions in the asset itself that occurred prior to our valuation date. It can, mean, can also mean offers uh, that have been placed for the asset itself. It can mean acquisitions of comparable businesses. It can mean the price at which comparable listed companies are traded on listed stock exchanges. All of these can be used as some sort of valuation benchmark. Uh, and finally, perhaps less commonly applied, depending on the circumstances, is the asset-based approach. So this typically involves <coughs> looking at the constituent um, assets and liabilities that make up the business and valuing them by reference to their book value or some other uh, constituent asset valuation. So each of these approaches, they have their strengths and weaknesses. Obviously, the income approach tends to be uh, liked often by courts and tribunals because of its transparency. It involves an explicit build-up of forecasts, an explicit calculation of the discount rate uh, at which those are discounted and you can you, you can inspect and dispute each uh, granular element of that so so that's the strength of this the downside is you know as it's colloquially put is sort of a garbage in garbage out problem if you're not putting reliable inputs into your discounted cash flow you're not going to get a reliable output the market approach can be um, can be quite well received to the extent that you have identified truly comparable transactions. You know, for example, if I'm looking at the value of an asset for which there was a large transaction a month before my valuation date, it's going to be very important to explain or to use, either use that transaction price as a benchmark or to explain why my valuation differs from that transaction price. It's going to be less important where there aren't any very comparable transactions or comparable assets. Um, and the asset-based approach, again, it depends how are the assets recorded on the balance sheet, if they're recorded at historical cost, you know, when were they purchased, is it close to the valuation date, are all the intangible assets of the business actually recorded on its balance sheet? Maybe, maybe not. Oft often we don't use that except as a sort of a flaw to the valuation for a going concern business. So the income approach or discounted cash flow, three main elements. So cash flow forecasts. These 
you know, ideally these are based up from contemporaneous evidence um, such as historical financial statement information, management accounts, business forecasts that were prepared contemporaneously, not for the purpose of the dispute, so they have a, you know, a certain element of reliability to them. Um, and, and these can also be informed by looking at market data. So if we're looking at a commodities business, we might look at external uh, forecasts of the commodity prices. We might look at the spot price of the commodity on the valuation date and so on. Now, cash flow forecasts are typically prepared for some finite period, 5, 10, maybe 15 years for, for some businesses. That does not imply that the business, the business has no value once the that forecast period has reached its end. You know, typically, we'd expect the business to either continue operating or to have some uh, residual value in terms of having assets that can be sold off or so on after the explicit forecast period. So this is what we often refer to as a terminal value in valuation. So if it's a business that's expected to continue operating we make some sort of long-run steady-state growth assumption, perhaps growth in line with long-run GDP growth or something to that effect, in order to forecast what cash flows will likely do at the end of the 10, 15-year forecast period, whatever it may be. And again, that, that may or may not be controversial depending on the, the, end of, the actual prospects of the underlying business. And then the final element is risk. So... This is factored into a discounted cash flow in terms of a discount rate. So what return would investors require to compensate them for, for taking on the risk of the cash flow forecasts? And again, each of these elements are likely to be highly contentious issues where the discounted cash flow approach is used. And, all, and the, the, I guess the key point here is the reliability of this all depends on the reliability of its inputs. So getting good evidence as to what the business was expecting going forwards, what it earned historically prior to the valuation date, all of that will help to corroborate any uh, income approach in DCF. Um, so the market approach, you know, the calculation mechanics are quite simple. I've just, we've just illustrated it with a simple uh, picture here. So you take a, a comparable company, value as your starting point. Now, the comparable company might be of a very different scale to the company you're looking at. So you might not look at the absolute value, but you can scale it by looking at a, a metric such as EBITDA, which is a measure of profit. You might look at industry-specific metrics such as reserves for an oil business, for example. So you take the value, divide it by your metric, and that gives you a multiple, which is basically a scaled valuation. You then apply, and you can do that for multiple companies or you can do that for one comparator depending on the particular circumstances you're looking at. Then you apply that to the same metric of your target company and that gives you a value. Um, I guess the key point here is each of these components are likely to be uh, contentious areas where a market approach is being used. So again, it's a case of sort of building up the story and understanding exactly what the business does, what its growth profile is, what its risk profile is, how does it compare to other companies within the same sector, and have there been prior transactions in the company itself? Because again, they, they tend to be very important benchmarks. Um, so those, those are sort of the technical valuation approaches as Jenny touched on earlier, there might be other bases for uh, looking at damages. So if we're looking at wasted costs, liquidated damages, loss of opportunities, these might entail uh, a different type of calculation themselves. You know, the liquidated damages might be uh, a specified calculation. Uh, so that, that's you know, something else to bear in mind. Um, so quick case study. Um, High Court case I was involved in a few years ago. We were looking at the alleged uh, undervalue of a sale of a Russian upstream oil producer. And this was long before uh, recent events, so, so they weren't necessarily factored in. But you know, the, the issue we were looking at was what was the market value as at the date at which the uh, asset was sold? And was the, value, was the price at which it was sold within a reasonable valuation range? 
Now, the opposing expert used a market approach uh, whereby he looked at essentially listed comparable companies in developed markets, and he simply looked at earnings multiples. And he came up with very high valuation um, and concluded that the asset was sold at an undervalue. What we did instead is we did you know, what I consider to be a more sophisticated approach whereby we looked at a combination of an income approach and market approach, but looking at actual Russian comparators, looking at industry-specific metrics. And when we did all of that, the, this painted a very different picture. There, there was a significant amount of country risk and uh, considerations that are very specific to Russian oil assets, you know, different tax structures and so on, uh, which simply weren't featured in the other experts' report. And when we reflected those in our valuation, we, we came up with a tight valuation range that was very consistent with the price at which they were sold. And because we had done something a bit more sophisticated and a bit more nuanced, um, it, it turned out to be far more convincing. And I think the other side could have benefited from challenging their expert a bit more at an earlier stage in that particular example. Um, so that comes to the end of this section. We've got a few key takeaways. I don't know if you want to close us off, Colin. Um, sure, yeah, I can do. You've heard us say a couple of times, the lawyers can look at this. We've deliberately taken this from the point of view of not making you experts, but of helping you to know some of the questions to ask. So are we considering this the right way? Uh, let me pick on the country risk, for example. You know, country risk, well, the country risk is, it's in that country, so therefore you apply that country risk premium. And you do see this. But actually, you can look and sort of question, well, actually, if this is an airport, and everything is in dollars, it's separate from the main economy, economy of the country, and it depends purely on tourists, so it doesn't matter, the country as a whole can go to hell in a handbasket from the point of view of the investment, and it can still be valid. Then your country risk is completely different from an airport that depends on what's happening in the local industry around that area and what's happening on the people from that area traveling as their main source of income. So that's what we're getting at in terms of understanding these are tools for valuation, but also you as the legal team have levers that will actually potentially impact on these. And the more you understand that, the more you'll be able to help your clients by, by sort of, well, you know, we're not sure if the actual breach was truly the, the first event. We think it was the second event that was determinative. Maybe prices have gone up at that stage and so on. You know, now, now, that's not for your experts to do, but it is legitimate for lawyers to do in terms of actually looking and you can look at how you best shape your case. And that's what we're trying to get across here in terms of these questions. There's plenty of theory and we can throw lots and lots of books at you. But take the core questions and just pull them out. So I'm not going to go through each of those line by line. You'll have these slides anyway. Um, but it's really those sort of things to pick up of how can I make a difference to the case? Why should I get involved in understanding this? I'll, I'll quote a lawyer recently, and he may recognise himself if he listens to this, who apologised to me. I'm sorry I kept on asking you questions. And I kept on and I kept on and I kept on. And I said, no, you were actually a great client because you really wanted to understand what was driving the damages. It was a particular complex power plant valuation that was how the market works and all sorts of different things that needed to be in there. But because he was asking the questions, he could think far better, not only on framing the case, but also in terms of how to put it forward to the arbitrators. Because if you don't understand it, well, how do you expect the arbitrators to understand it? And if the arbitrators don't understand it, how do you expect them to accept that as a basis? So it's really key to make sure that we as experts, who can be guilty of going off in our own world or coming up with, well, it's the DCF and it's this and it's that, and actually stop us and make it simple. There are ways that you can take away. DCF is sometimes disliked by arbitration tribunals for being a black box.
but it's actually the opposite. As Joe said, it's transparent, but it's only transparent if you get under the bonnet, if I can put it that way. You actually need to get in and understand. Right, tell me what are the key variables. <coughs> Show me what happens if we change this. You know, why are we using this version and not that one, when I've got some evidence over here that actually says that they didn't have the capacity to deliver what's being claimed in the model. If you get into those sort of discussions, so I think you know, the one takeaway from me about this is you have a lot of control in this, but only if you engage. Right. Um, well, I thought that that was, that was wonderful. And uh, let me now start the Q&A session, reminding our online audience that you can uh, send in your questions um, online. I already have a few. Uh, well, let me uh, perhaps open it up to the audience uh, here. Uh, see that, all right. Uh, why don't we have that? And I see already two hands, and I think Good things come in three. If there's a third hand somewhere, we could pick up three questions together and pose them. Please. Thank you very much, first of all. <clears throat> My first question will be in relation to your one of your quotes in your presentation. The output is only as reliable as your input. But in terms of non-producing energy power plants or mining projects, what is your like, biggest challenge or how would you apply these questions in those non-producing mining projects which has been expropriated now, there's an investment arbitration claim and the court are deciding to evaluate the damages. We know that arbitri uh, tribunals might be quite sensitive when it comes to evaluating non-producing mining projects and in terms of, you know, as an expert, what's your opinion on that and what, what is the most reliable way of assessing those sort of cases? Sure. Right, um, so th there's a second hand over there, please. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for the presentation. Uh, very informative. Uh, my question is with regards to the modern DCF approach that was adopted by the arbitration tribunal in the Tethyan case, which was an award uh, awarded against Pakistan basically for a mine, a dispute over mines. So I really wanted to hear your thoughts about the modern DCF approach and how it is, because I felt that it's significantly different in its uh, valuation techniques from traditional DCF. If you could please shed some light on that. Right, do we have the third question in the audience, please? Thank you. So my question could be perhaps to some extent immature, but what influence does our inflation that we witness on the method we choose. For example, because the market approach would lead to disproportionate damages. Companies really do are, are not valued according to their book value to what the stock market depicts. So would you choose the market value despite their value, their, their real book value, which is much, much lower in our current days? Thank you. Thank you. Well, how will you divide it? Maybe I should answer the first one. Yeah, so I guess when we're looking at an asset that's non-producing, I think the first thing to understand is what are the specific steps or what are the hurdles that are required to be overcome for it to reach a state at which it is producing. Uh, before we even get into doing a valuation, I think we need to make a sort of qualitative judgment on the balance of probabilities. Are those hurdles going to be overcome or not? You know, for example, does the project require financing that the market simply wasn't able to provide. So I think looking at that, taking a step back and looking at that story first before we get into the valuation is really important. Then, you know, as to how we evaluate if it is producing, I, th I think, you know, it depends on the specific um, resource in question and so on. We can look at forecasts for the price of that resource in order to, to, to determine what revenues would be. We can look at technical expertise or um, feasibility studies and so on to see what the level of resources are. So we can get a sense of what the revenues might be if, if this thing is operating. But it's a question of uh, weighing that against the uh, correct level of risk and reflecting risk appropriately in your DCF in that case. <coughs> 
add to that. Uh, I mean, we can, we can keep on, on each one probably for a while, but it's a lot of these businesses are valued. You know, let, let's talk outside arbitration. They, they transfer for very large sums before they've ever started in actual operation. Um, that tells you when you actually dig into this, it's usually done on a discounted cash flow basis, that it is right and proper to actually look at you know, what will be expected and you can use that. And, and tribunals have historically been reluctant to do that. You know, if you ever hear talk of the World Bank guidelines, ignore them. Um, it's old, it's wrong, it was never actually accurate in the first place. And I can give you a whole treatise on that. Um, that doesn't, though, mean that discounted cash flow is right in every case, as Joe said. So it's just understanding: was this really going to be able to deliver in the way that's being put forward? Yeah, I guess that brings us to modern DCF. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, so is it? Is it just another DCF? Is it something new? Is it something very different? Uh, I think that was the question, if, if not, remind me. Um, I, and I guess the particular question was a bit was an eye to the Tetian Copper, but I don't know whether that is too specific uh, a case study to reflect upon. Well, I think we need to refer to that specific case study because that's the big example where it's been used, and I'm not aware of it sort of having caught on more broadly than that, perhaps correct me if I'm wrong, Colin. Um, first of all, I would say I've not actually encountered a modern DCF in practice. I've not actually had an Excel model gone under the bonnet and seen what it looks like. So it, it's, from my perspective at least, it's all a bit of a theoretical discussion. Is it is it something fundamentally different? I mean, I think mo modern DCF rests on sort of some sort of Monte Carlo analysis of different potential scenarios and then discounting that at, a, at more of a risk-free rate rather than a conventional DCF, which looks at constructing one explicit cash flow forecast and, dis and reflecting risk through the, through the selection of appropriate discount rate. So in that sense, it is something quite fundamentally different. Um, what do I think of it? Not too sure. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to, I'd like to sort of get under the bonnet and actually see one of these models in practice before saying anything too conclusive. I did feel that uh, this question was quite. It, it drew me to a lot of curiosity as well because I couldn't find any academic literature around this. Any detailed discussions or methodologies being described when it came to modern DCF? Yeah, no, I, I, I looked into this a while ago and I've, the discussions around it I've found so, simply say, oh, this is just another example of real options analysis. But when I've read into the sort of actual Tetian um, award and so on, it's not clear to me if that's actually a, a complete and accurate description of what so-called modern DCF is actually doing, so I'm not too sure. I mean, the challenge is that it's certainty equivalents that mean you don't have to use the discount rate. But who says they're certainty equivalents? So you come back to the garbage in, garbage out discussion. Yeah. And I'm not saying it was garbage, I'm not done. But, but the point is, uh, this is where it was right in terms of you need to actually understand exactly what the detail was of could you truly say that those were actually certain? Right. Then we've got one more, I think, in terms of the initial round. In terms of inflation costs in particular and the joys of managing that, I think. Yeah. Yes, I don't know whether we could bring Jennifer in perhaps for that. Yeah. So I think with inflation, um, it's a good question, yes. And I think your question maybe is about stock market prices not really representing genuine like value on companies' balance sheets. Indeed. If you look at uh, the S&P 500, there are only perhaps two or three companies that really increase their value 
the others are just losing value on a daily basis, and still they are part of the S&P 500. So if you were to choose that index to value and assess the damages, you have a disproportionate sum in the end of awards. Do you agree with me? Or? So the difference between price and value? So the price exactly. The value of the companies, the real value, and the apparent value. Because, for example, investors just flooded those markets with their money because it was a safe heaven, but it led to a disproportionate market value. So how would you, for example, help your client get damages according to the market value when you know that it's not what he would get perhaps soon after Russia invades Ukraine? Because we've seen the European stock market fell, whereas the US market rose again. This is what I'm saying. What method do you use when you choose the formula? And this is where you sort of have the discussion on intrinsic value. You know, what's the, what's the real value, if you like, versus what the market is attributing as value at a particular time. So, and it's why you have to be very cautious sometimes when you're using a market analysis in terms of, you know, is it the same time? Is it the same situation? Is the company in the same situation overall as what you're considering? So if you're considering, you know, you know if you take a, a war situation and you've got another one, you could say, well, yes, that's, that's very similar. But even as you've said, within that, you get stock markets moving in different directions. So that's why you've got to be so careful in terms of applying a market-based valuation on. It only works if you've got really the same um, circumstances. It can get you close without the others, but it's not It's not necessarily a right because another company was valued at this basis, therefore that's that's the that's the level that we can take it. I don't know, Joe, what else? Yeah, I mean, if, if you're talking, it depends if you're talking about using the price of the, these listed stocks as a comparator or if you're talking about the value of the, the stocks themselves. I mean, if, if you're looking at something that is actively traded and you know, willing buyers and willing sellers are transacting at these prices, you're going to have a hard time arguing that those prices don't represent some sort of value. Um, now, if we're looking at an example where the, the particular market is less liquid, the, the stocks are more thinly traded, then you can start to depart from the, the, the listed share price more strongly. So I think this issue comes up in um, a lot of the the Cayman Islands minority closeout disputes around the, the ADRs, where you know, often experts will argue for and against using the listed price of those stocks as a, a true valuation benchmark versus using some sort of fundamental valuation through DCF or other means, because in those cases they're looking at stocks that are more thinly traded. Right, well, uh, let me bring in uh, three questions from the online audience and then I think uh, you could just reflect whether you have any last questions and then we'll come uh, back to you again. So all three questions send in anonymously, so I think we'll have to, you'll have to trust me to present them in the most uh, generous way. The first question is, uh, to what extent is the risk of different regions within the host state uh, considered when they're assessing the risk? Second question, um, how is the country's risk uh, as considered by the uh, PWC country risk map quantified and included in their calculation of the value of an investment? And the third question is, uh, so the way how it is put, is it more recommendable for a foreign investor asking for invest compensation to go to investment arbitration tribunals or domestic jurisdictions? Um, and I guess probably what this question is sort of phrasing, if kind of to repackage, was it a focus on valuation experts? Um, whether investment arbitration tribunals would be likely to use more business-friendly, investor-friendly valuation methods than uh, domestic jurisdictions, domestic courts. So all three very interesting points. Um, so the first one was about uh, risk of different regions within, differences between different regions within one state. Yeah, 
I can touch on that quickly. I, I, I think the answer to the question is yes, it should be understood and potentially reflected in the valuation depending on the nature of the risks. The problem you're going to have there is quantifying the different risks of different regions. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of data available to help us look at um, risk for a country as a whole, and that sort of goes to what the second question was getting at. Um, but looking at region-specific risk is going to be more difficult. There might, depending on the particular country and and the particular regions you're looking at, there might be, for example, investor surveys uh, that look at what investors state the, ad the additional risk that they require, or the additional return that they require for accepting the risk of that region is. Um, you may or may not be able to find that sort of data. So, yes, in principle, but in, in practice, there, there might be challenges. Yes, I think that reminded me somewhat of, of an expression that, that Professor Lawrence Friedman, Professor of War Studies at King's once said that there's an iron rule uh, developed in 1990s that if one is any, any, at any point asked about any country that, the right res that you know nothing about, then the right response says, of course, but it's different in the south. So I think that regions is often a helpful way out. Um, I think that there was a particularly sort of rather specific question about the country risk map and how we sort of extract and quantify things out of it. Yeah, so so, so the map I don't think uh, attempts to quantify a country risk premium. It, it simply puts different countries into different risk buckets, um, which you can take as one sort of qualitative input. So in terms of actually quantifying the country risk premium, there's a few different sources that you can look at. There's investor surveys, as I just mentioned. Um, the challenge with those is you know, who's been asked and what exactly have they been asked in the survey. That may or may not give you a reliable answer to the question that you're actually trying to ask. The other sort of common sort of data source is uh, things that look at the sovereign yields or sovereign credit ratings of the country. Um, so the countries with a, a lower credit rating, all else equal, you might expect to also have more risky equity investments. And you can use the, the yield spreads between the risky country and somewhere like the US as some sort of starting benchmark for quantifying that, that level of additional risk. Um, right, and so the third question was, I think, was the trickiest one. Is, I mean, we I think that we are here looked at really the variety of approaches and assumptions that one would have within arbitration, but I think it was really kind of rather a sweeping system comparison, you know, all other things being equal, which they of course never are. Should an investor go and litigate in domestic courts or internationally? With I guess, you know, again, reading the question charitably with a particular eye on, on to valuation methods. And then uh, it, it, is, it is one that you can't answer that generically, I don't think. Um, it could be, but it it really depends on looking at that particular jurisdiction, that particular case. How have the courts of that jurisdiction treated valuation issues that are similar? What sort of reception are you likely to receive in terms of those um, courts? Is there a, if this is against a state, is, is there a home bias um, that means that they would actually favour the state more in terms of the approach? Um, and compare that then to what you think you would get in terms of the arbitration itself. Right, and I guess probably on the loyalty side that people would often say that in, to the extent that in domestic law those would be raised as public law claims in many domestic legal orders, the remedy would not really be mostly compensation, uh, but something something else. I don't know whether um, uh, Joe or Jennifer would like to add anything on what we have said so far. No, I don't think so. Uh, right, well, uh, I mean, we have had a very sort of full and robust discussion, but uh, because we had such a rich picking in the first round, uh, I wouldn't want to leave anybody sort of hanging if they had a good question just prepared. Please. Um, 
Thank you for the presentation. I, I wanted to ask about the performance part. Of, uh, so we talked about the bridge date and the award date, but usually the awards are not formed momentarily. So the actual uh, So I'm wondering whether the experts give any sort of adjustment to the award date. Yeah, so we can in your evaluations, how the battle demand can be adjusted given the time difference between when, for example, the, the award date and the performance date, and whether is that something that forms part of the valuation as well. Okay. Um, so, so you mean the, the, the fact that there's a gap between when the losses assessment is performed and then ultimately when the award is made by the tribunal, say, a year or a year later? Not that what made by the tribunal, but once the award is made, then the party who is to be to pay those damages, the performance date is rather late, and um, there is a time gap, and a lot of circumstances might change at risk and uh, inflation problems. So, uh, I was wondering whether there are any adjustment mechanisms in the valuation itself, but just the amount provided by the experts at one point. So typically, we do a evaluation in the course of doing our work whenever that is and then we maybe adjust that for the date of the award but then once that's made at the date of the, date of the award that reflects facts and circumstances at the, as that date then if, if, the, if the award isn't paid we may add some interest onto that to award the claimant for, for not being compensated when they should have been. But I'm not aware of any other adjustment compensation. No but it's a, it's a good question in the sense of at times there really should be. You know, if the award isn't paid within a certain period, then the market could change dramatically and you might say, well, it should have been something completely different at this stage. Um, but so far, the only ones I can recall have been interest that's actually applied. Uh, right, well, I mean, I think then we are, let me just abuse a bit my own chair's prerogative and just ask some things that are really I'm wondering about. Um, so one, uh, I think uh, under the rubric of country risk uh, premium, I think the one thing that tribunals have been not entirely consistent about in the Venezuelan setting was whether expropriation risk is part of the country risk, uh, which uh, I mean, I appreciate that it might be sort of kind of a bit more on the lawyerly side as well, but I think it was, it has been really sort of pitched up as a valuation issue. Um, any thoughts on that? I mean, you're right, it is a legal point in terms of do you or don't you include the expropriation risk. Um, and it's it hasn't been determined, I don't think, in any clear way of, right, this is the way all future tribunals should apply it. Um, if you think about it in terms of people investing, when they actually make the investment, there's a big difference between if they invest at a time when a country is stable, and I will pick Venezuela as you mentioned it, versus if they invest when there's already been 10 expropriations and they can see that there's likely to be more. Um, but I think it is something that actually there isn't a clear body of right, this is exactly how it should be done. Yes, I think that is my sort of kind of a bit of a sense as well because I mean I suppose that most treaties would often say that you know you cannot artificially suppress the price simply by announcing that you're going to expropriate so that would be a bit unfair on the investor but it also be a bit unfair of the state is sort of to invite to invent a hypothetical perfectly governed non-expropriating state and I think it's both serial expropriators fall somewhat uneasily in the middle, so at least uh, the normative intuition is a bit harder. But at least it's good to know that you also don't have a perfect answer. There, there isn't a perfect answer, unfortunately, in that sense. And it is, you know, the country risk premium change, obviously, because of what's been seen in terms of expropriation previously. Um, but it's not, you know, unless you've seen different, I haven't seen a, a particular clarity in terms of that? Um, well, I mean, I think that in these times, uh, I think one 
could not let environmental climate change issues not to be mentioned in a topic particularly because we have spoken so much about natural resource and oil and gas. How does, how do, I guess, international communities' efforts to move in that direction and kind of to wean off the fossil fuel uh, pump uh, affect everything, anything that we have talked about so far? So I guess in, in terms of a discounted cash flow analysis, you've got to look at the cash flow forecast side of things and the discount rate side of things. So, you know, if, we, if we're looking at an asset um, sort of going out of favour due to environmental concerns, like coal, for example, are the projections that you're provided with, are they consistent with uh, that changing demand pattern for the good? So. Are you, are you forecasting unrealistic demand and price increases that are just not consistent with the sort of ESG environment? And then on, on the discount rate side of things, you know, there is. I, I read some stuff about there being you know, uh, risk premia added to discount rates to reflect environmental concerns and environmental premium. Um, it's not something I've seen used in practice, but it might be an area that is going to be developed in the sort of years to come in valuation. Uh, right, well, I mean, th then let me ask the final question as well that, uh, you know, I would imagine that the last 10 days have made many people in different fields question the assumptions about normality um, of the region and the world. No, again, um, an, an interstate war in uh, Europe, sanctions, likely counter sanctions, um, how would that qualify and make you adjust your approaches that you would have done in early February? Or is it too early to speculate? It's too early to have some of the data, but there's no question that you have to speculate if you were looking at the value now. Um, and. Obviously, it makes fundamental changes, as you've seen with the financial crash, the commodities crash, wars elsewhere. It will make a fundamental change in terms of what the reactions are. Um, and it's the, the bit where it may be too early is actually the longer term. You know, okay, what is going to happen in six months' time or a year's time? You know, will this be something that stops? Will it? just be contained to Ukraine? Will it go elsewhere? What will it do to the supply chains? What will it do to financial chains? All of those questions. Um, I think they'll be coming through in cases, there's no doubt about that, but we don't yet have enough data to truly sort of say, right, this is the way it's going. What we'd have to do is, when we get faced with that, is to actually look, okay, what's the particular issue we're dealing with and how do we see that being? Well, thank you. I don't know whether Jennifer or Joe have anything to add, whether in what any particular points or general concluding thoughts. No, it's, it's, it's a difficult question. I mean, if, if we were looking at a valuation date in early February of a Ukrainian asset, you know, to what extent was the market pricing in the risk of, of current events? To what extent were they doing so accurately? It's, it's an impossible question to answer, really. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a more fundamental criticism that's often levelled at valuation theory or finance theory that the risk of these extreme events isn't correctly priced in. But you know, that's, I guess, that that's, goes back to more of a sort of theoretical or conceptual debate, and, and there's no sort of clear answer to those kind of questions. Well put. <laughs> um, right, well, uh, I mean, I, 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 have to, I can only repeat from, from, from previous years how uh, fascinated and pleased I'm always um, to uh, speak to Colin and his team. I think that this is really a, a always to reassure that in this field, uh, neither law nor a valuation expert um, could stand on their own. 
Well, they would think that plainly evaluation experts could stand on their own much better than lawyers could stand on their own. But uh, they have to be uh, in the same room uh, working uh, together uh, from the very beginning. Uh, before I conclude, I just wanted, I think we were talking with Colin about uh, a common uh, sort of an, an alumnus uh, of the investment law module, Sebastian Blomer, who was also has participated in these events a couple of times, even though he couldn't be here today. Uh, yeah, so I think that very you know, grateful to Seb as well as he's uh, following online. Right, well, uh, it, 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 I'm only left with the most uh, pleasing parts. Uh, please first join me in thanking Colin and uh, Joe and Jennifer in the customary manner.